And good evening. We are here. Welcome. We are here, Murfreesboro City School Board meeting. We are in our process of looking for a director of schools. And we have interviews every night this week. And we are glad for those of you that are watching us from home or are doing so. Let me remind board members, please, uh, that when you are speaking, please take your mask off. That way it helps the audio for television. They have asked us to do that, and I'll just remind you of that. Our applicant tonight is Dr. Christina Harris, who is with us. She is presently employed at Wilson County Board of Education. And Dr. Harris, I will ask you to tell us what you would like to tell the audience outside about yourself, and then we will go from there. Excellent. Thank you for having me tonight. It's so nice to see all of you in person. Now we did the Zoom a little bit earlier, but I'm so glad to be here. I, I do currently work in Wilson County Schools, but I want to start by saying I, I am not here alone. There are a lot of people behind me that have helped me get to this point. So what I will share with you tonight is because of a lot of other people that have invested in me and, and I really appreciate them and several of them are watching tonight. So hi mom. But I do work in Wilson County Schools. I'm currently our supervisor of educator effectiveness and I work with teachers and leaders to build their capacity to increase outcomes for students. And, and I enjoy what I do. I love teaching and learning and I love helping leaders figure out out, uh, the best ways to meet the goals that they have for their schools and the community. Um, I have been an elementary and middle school principal in two different states and I appreciate what you put out, what you were looking for in a director because that is the reason I applied. I applied because of the selection criteria that you put out and I felt like it, it was a good fit for what I've done, my experiences and what I could possibly bring to this community. So thanks for having me tonight. We're, gl we're glad to have you. Let me ask you this question. What will you do to create an atmosphere in schools that will lead to educational excellence for all students? I will build uh, a, a strategy um, that leads to the outcomes that we really want, which is for every student to grow we want every student to achieve, but more importantly, wherever they, are, wherever they are, we want them to take the next step. You do that together, you do that by building a purposeful community. So whatever the visions are that each administrator has for their building should fit within the district set of priorities and where we want our students to go. Building around an area of focus means we can focus very succinctly on something that's important and help build skills and strategies around that, and then we monitor the work. In the end, we want to make sure that everybody knows which direction we're rowing and that we're all rowing together. If you think about, you know, Dory and getting all those fish that were going to die in the net, mm -hmm. she just started talking to them. And so you build relationships with people uh, to build a community of excellence so we're all moving in the same direction. And there's a lot of research about how to build a, build a purposeful community, and I know how to do that, and that's what I would like to do here. Okay. What do you consider to be your major strengths that you would bring to this position? Absolutely. So I, I am a Gallup certified strengths coach and all, all that really means is that I know myself well and I know how to look for the strengths and build upon them in others. My top strength is relator, which means I know how to build relationships with individuals and among teams to do really hard things. My second top strength is being strategic, which I just, talked about a little bit, but if you don't know what your goals are, then you don't know where you're headed. So you have to have goals, you gotta have action steps, and you have to have a feedback cycle. Uh, additionally, I, I'm an achiever and an activator, which means I put my hand up first, and I will step forward into traffic, even if there might be oncoming traffic. I'm not afraid of that, I'm not afraid to try, but I am gonna do the work with excellence. So whatever I set out to do, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it to the very best of my abilities, and I'll take responsibility as I go. Okay, thank you. Ms. Barton? Quite a process. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, the first criteria I have is, is um, talking about change. And you know, education is full of change. Um, if you could describe a significant change that you initiated in your current role, 
and then tell us what evidence you have to show that it was a positive change and how did you build support for that change? Absolutely. Change management, I think, is what all of us have been doing since May and the lockdowns and the, you know, onslaught of COVID-19 and restrictions. So uh, Dr. Wright, our director in Wilson County Schools, asked me to lead the charge in uh, how we were going to reopen schools safely so that learning could continue. So I had the wonderful opportunity of working with over 100 people in 60 hours of time and I gave you a copy of our of our reopening plan and when we started in May there was not a book on how to do this COVID stuff no, <laughs> nobody really knew and so I read everything I could uh, I know about change management it's something I actually teach to our current set of administrators uh, knowing that you have to all understand where you're going and, and manage those personal transitions because this is really difficult work. But we were charged with coming up with three models, traditional, hybrid, and remote. And along the way, we added a fourth one with our virtual learning program. And by June, we had a, a framework that we presented to our school board. Uh, by the end of June, we were able to tell parents what, exactly what this was going to look like and put out a survey to find out what they wanted to see. Uh, we shared the entire plan in July and we started school in August. So we're still working that plan today. Even yesterday and today we were gathering the information and the data to find out because we're currently all remote and, in Wilson County and deciding what our metrics look like and how we're able to reopen schools next week, if at all. And so those decisions are made on a weekly basis with our COVID task force, of which I'm a part of and, and, and lead with, with our director of schools. Well, that is a change that nobody can compete with. <laughs> right. um, educational research and initiatives, you know, we, we try to keep up with those the, the best that we can, but you have to maintain a balance between programs, keeping programs that work in place or adopting new ones. So how do you maintain a balance and still able to bring in new initiatives? You have to start with the data. Your data tells you what you need, it tells you uh, which students are achieving and, and which ones are not, uh, which schools need what resources. So it, you've got to start with the data and then you have conversations and you build a plan. And we, we're doing that with our administrators right now. Uh, part of what I'm doing tomorrow is helping administrators figure out their area of focus for their next 90 days. What are they going to work on? And how are they going to tackle that? What supports do they need? How are they going to know if they're making progress? So I also know that there are a lot of changes that come down that uh, never we, we don't see all the way through and I think it's time to really evaluate what's working and what's not what can come off of the plate for teachers and administrators what do we want to keep uh, but realizing change is hard people they don't love change up front so they need a lot of support they need the resources to be able to do it uh, and they need feedback about if it's going well you can't just get mad at them when the data didn't improve uh, you got to be talking to them and, and building those those changes along the way so everybody sees what's happening being very transparent in the process thank you uh, our next criterion is basically talking about effective listening abilities and um, a willingness to maintain an open door policy can you give us an example of a time that you've changed your mind and taken a different course of action as a result of listening to others? Yes, I'm very stubborn by nature, but I will say having been a principal uh, tamed that a lot because principal, one person can't do anything well on their own or lead effective change with children. That just, it doesn't work that way. So one of the things that happened this summer it, as we were talking about our reentry plans was how to, should we have a virtual learning program? Should there be a full-time option? And at the beginning of the summer, we said no. And I, I felt pretty strongly that as a team, it was a, it was a lot to just manage traditional hybrid and, and remote processes. How on earth are we gonna create a whole new school in a virtual learning program and I, I was one that said let's just not because it's it's we want to do these three things well so when we surveyed our parents they said we'd like a virtual learning option and then when we went to our board the board said we need a virtual learning option 
So we made a virtual learning option. And it, it is still as difficult as we thought it was going to be, but it was still the right thing to do. I think forever we will have virtual learning programs that are full time because there are students and families that it truly benefits uh, that, that have other issues in a, in a traditional brick and mortar school. So it was a good change, but I, I fought it at the beginning, I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In your administration, um, what avenues do you have open for people to offer input? You know, all people, students, parents, teachers, uh, community leaders. And how do you plan to have time available for all that are involved? You know, uh, another thing I'm always interested in is when you make a decision and it goes against uh, constituent input, how do you follow up with those constituents? That's a ginormous question, Mr. I know. Okay. I you will might be have happy. to come back to it. I will. I will be happy to go back to part one if you like. Well, For me, there are a lot of parts. The listening to that. part. Let's start with the listening part. Let's so I, I understand that I'm new and scary to people, and so taking a chance on an external applicant is is a risk because I'd have to build a lot of relationships and rather quickly. But that is my top strength. I am strategic, and so I I lean into my strengths. I. My live by my calendar. My calendar dictates the work to make sure it gets done and gets done well and everybody gets what they need from me and with me. So I would build in time just like I would for anything else. I need, I need to reach out to people and I need to go ask and listen and they need to be able to access me but I need it to be in a very strategic way so that they get the best part of me and not the leftover when I'm really tired at 5:30 at night what's a good time for you and I to to work through whatever needs to be resolved and then the second part of the question talking about um, making a decision that goes against constituent input and how you follow up with constituents I think up front people have to understand why you're getting the input and how it's going to be used. If you're just getting it to gather information, people need to know that. But if they think they're voting on something and then you don't go with what the majority feels like they voted on, then it's like, hey, you didn't do what we, we said. And so I think that could be uh, a lack of communication up front. If you tell people how the information is going to be used, uh, I think they're more likely to give honest feedback and then not be so upset. Uh, but secondly, coming back to the why in every decision is important for people. People have to understand why you make decisions. So if you don't start with the why, people just think you're willy-nilly and you have to build that capacity and people have to learn your, your communication patterns, but you'll have to commu over communicate back on the change question. We know that research says when people are going through significant changes, a new director would be a significant change for this district, especially an external applicant like me. It will take me several times and opportunities in various ways to communicate why and what and how over and over and over because people will say, I didn't know, nobody told me, I don't know why we're doing this and they'll just get frustrated. So that's something I, I have in the back of my mind that would need to be a focus. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Moore. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Harris. Um, <clears throat> my questions are about um, building support for our schools. And the first question is, can you tell us what you have done to create excitement and generate support for public schools? Well, personally, I'm a pretty excited person. I love education. I love teaching and learning. And so if, if I'm frumpy dumpy about it, as my mother would say, uh, nobody else is going to be excited. So I love coming to work. I love the work that I do and I love the people that I work with. And educators are a, a unique uh, breed of people. And the community send their best to us, right? Parents send their best to us every single day. They're not holding their best back. They're sending us their very best. So it's, it's really important that people understand we're excited about what we do. But secondly, when I was an elementary principal at, at, at Gompers Elementary School, uh, it was a neighborhood school and parents were some, somewhat invested, but they, there was a hunger to be more invested. And so the PTO was not very excitable and not very many people and not a very diverse population that was representative at all of our student population was participating. So one of the things we thought about were these family nights, you know, that kind of became all the rage there for a while. The first family night we had, it was not well attended and it was mostly 
parents uh, who were white and had money that came and participated in, in their child's learning. And I said, Where, where's the other half of my student body and their families? So I went driving around uh, and asking those families the next few weeks and rode on the bus just to find out where they are and what are you doing. And they said, we don't have a way to get here. And the times are not conducive to our work schedules. So I came back to the leadership team and said, hey, let's make this more accessible to our families. And you know what? We had buses that went out on all of our family nights. We provided food and childcare. And the attendance went way up. And I had several families just say, thank you for listening to what we needed as, as a body. Because, you know, 3 o'clock on a Wednesday isn't always a wonderful time for everyone to participate in what's happening in a school or things like parent-teacher conferences. You have to look at your times for that. It cannot be just when it's when teachers are working. It's got to be when parents can come and participate. So that's just one example. Thank you. Um, and I'll ask for another example. Can you give us an example of how you have worked with a group outside of the school system to generate support for schools? So that could be businesses, local government, community groups, the media. So being part of um, Wilson County Schools has given me a different perspective on how we utilize our different partnerships. Uh, and our Family and Community Resource Center, you know, different people are doing different things and building those partnerships. However, when I was in Clarksville, Montgomery County, um, our STEM programs were really taking off. And I know that, that we have several schools here in Murfreesboro that are STEM designated schools. The idea of helping the community understand what happens in schools is really eye-opening. So one of the things that happened in Clarksville was we got teachers out into businesses so that they could understand how what they were teaching was impacting students learning. When I was in Madison, we did it the other way. We had a principal for a day program where people from various uh, vendors and organizations could come uh, and it was it was a way to generate money as well. They, they paid uh, money to the school to come spend a day to see what actually happened in a school. They followed the principal around. Wonderful way to fundraise. And then you spent the next day together talking about the work and generating that support. And I got to do that as a principal. And I think that's a phenomenal way to help people understand what happens in schools. But then like we did in Clarksville, sending teachers out, help understand what's happening in the community. You've got to see both sides. Thank you. Uh, my questions will be focused on school board relations and policy. Uh, it is very important that the board and the director make an effort to understand and respect each other's roles so that we can avoid unnecessary conflicts that we know that's going to happen from time to time. Can you share with us your style of working through conflict? Yes. I'm going to go back a little ways on, on conflict. When I was an administrative intern, when I served as an assistant principal, earning my master's degree in ed leadership, I worked as the AP for two years at an elementary school. And when I got to my mid-year conference with our director of schools, because it's a very small district, and he was my supervisor, he said, Christina, you're afraid, and I need you to jump into way more conflict. And I said, hmm? And he said, the, the feedback that I'm getting from the teachers in the building and the principal that you work with is telling me that you are you don't know how to manage conflict. You, you avoid it. You don't want to really have it. So I need you to jump into it. And the whole second semester, I want you to get into as much conflict as you can to just practice it. Well, I was scared to death. I said, Dr. Bustler, this just sounds very overwhelming. He said, it will be, but I need you to try. And so that's what I did. Literally, the rest of that semester and into the second year, I got into anything I could find that was related to conflict. And what I learned from that was it goes back to the heart of the matter. You have to understand what you really want and what the other person or party really wants. And you have to engage in dialogue, not screaming and hollering. Uh, but you have to seek to understand and seek to be understood so that you can come to some agreement about what we both really want and how we're going to achieve that. So this, after the tornado happened in Wilson County and we, and we were entering the COVID lockdown time, I did two book studies with our administrators, um, Crucial Conversations and Crucial Accountability and really unpacking what does it mean to jump into these conversations that are really difficult that 
nobody really wants to have. How do you have them well and, and how do you work through it and hold one another accountable to get what you really want, whatever that is? Okay. Uh, developing and adopting policy is the board's major responsibility. And so have you had any experience writing policy? When I was in HR for three years uh, in Wilson County, I had the opportunity to look at, at many policies that were under review. And one of the things we do is we review policies in the district on an ongoing basis. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very familiar with policy and I, I'm not, don't ask me to, to write it from scratch by myself. That's gonna have to be a team effort. But I do understand how policy works and I understand that it's, it's crucial to the work of the board and I have to understand it in order to follow it and it's also mine to make sure happens in the district. So I, I do have about three years of experience with policy. Okay. Uh, we depend on our director to provide us with sufficient information so that we can make informed decisions and control the results of our decisions. What is your plan to communicate with the board? Strategically and effectively. I, I do feel like one of my strengths is communication, both written and oral. So I, I provided you this, this packet tonight just as some evidence of how my writing style is and how I like to present things. I want it to be clear. I want it to be where you know what we're talking about and you can ask questions if you're not sure. So I would do a lot of things in writing, uh, but I, I like picking up the phone and just having conversations too. And I realize you can't do that all of the time, especially when things are moving very quickly with an entire board. Uh, so I've worked really hard to become a good communicator in writing, but also in the process of dialogue, you've got to be able to effectively communicate the needs of the district and keep everybody up to date so they can make informed decisions. So what I've given you tonight is a sample of how I operate. I, I give a lot of information up front, give you some time to look at it. I want the back and forth Q and A so that you get what you need so you can make the best decisions for students and teachers in the community. Okay. Ms. Moore. next set of questions are about diversity and equity. What evidence can you cite to demonstrate you have the ability to work effectively with diverse student populations and multicultural groups? I shared a little bit about my experience at Gompers Elementary School. 45% of our students um, were black, uh, Hispanic, and of Asian descent, mostly Hmong. And we had about 45% of our students on free and reduced lunch with very minimal resources. We didn't meet the title threshold at that time. So we had all of the needs and very few of the resources. So I had to build a network of people to support the children and the teachers at the school. There were only 250 kids, which at the time didn't sound like a lot, but when you're the only administrator, I had no full-time support staff. I had a part-time social worker and a part-time psychologist. I had a full-time secretary and one instructional coach. That was it. So I really had to reach out to some other people and build a network with the parents. So part of what I asked for when we were investing in trying to build a playground for these children that had a horrible playground, they, they needed a much better playground. Every other school around us seemed to have a really nice playground. We did not. Um, while we were you know, working on those plans, I asked them questions about what they wanted for their children. And by and large, they wanted their children to do better than they did. At the end of the day, they wanted more for their children than they had for themselves. But when you, when you dug even more and you asked questions of people that were not comfortable coming to the school, they had really horrible experiences on their own. So how they felt about school was not very positive. So it was up to me to build relationships with these people and help my teachers build relationships in these people so that a greater part of our population felt, coming, felt comfortable coming to our school engaging in the conversations that were necessary to get their children whatever supports that they needed. Um, one of the ways we did that, there was, I want, I want to say this correctly, we were identifying, we were over identifying children with disabilities uh, disproportionately to um, our dem demographics. So uh, in kindergarten and first grade, every other black boy was coming to the table as having behavior disabilities. And that, that just could not be true based on the research. So how do you have that conversation with staff 
to do what's right for students and figure out how do we set up classrooms of support to get them what they need because they didn't really have a disability. They just needed something different. They needed a lot more support and resources, but I didn't have the funding, so I had to go get it from other community partners uh, and vendors, and I needed to hire more teachers that looked like our students so that they felt like they had uh, someone that looked like them that they could go to, and I had to make sure every child in the building had that go-to person, whether that was the custodian or the cafeteria monitor or the EA that was on duty in the morning on the playground as they were getting off the bus. So it, it really took everybody to build that community of support to, to, to meet the diverse learning needs of our students. Thank you. And now looking more broadly outside of just one school, how can a school system work toward education equity across racial and economic differences? I'm really passionate about this work and none of this happens in a silo or a vacuum. Some of the best work I feel like I've done recently um, with uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Jennifer Cothran in Wilson County, is about strategic placement of students. And we've presented at uh, to the State Department and, and various groups in Middle Tennessee about this work. We've looked at the data that we have for our students and what we know by from the research is that if a student has an ineffective teacher for two years in a row, they can't make up those learning gaps. They just can't. Mm -hmm. So part one is making sure that we strategically place our students into classrooms. If they have an ineffective teacher one year, they need the most effective teacher the next year to make sure that they get what they need. But secondly, teachers need support. So no teacher wakes up and says, oh, I want to be the ineffective teacher. Let, let me be that person. Nobody wants to do that. And it just means our teachers need way more support to do that. So part of my role at, in educator effectiveness is building support plans for teachers and growth plans for teachers. And we've had a lot of success in graduating teachers from these plans where we, we look at exactly what they need and we give them those supports so they can become a highly effective teacher. And I think we're at 97 percent of our teachers are at or above expectations um, on our uh, in our evaluation system and like 88 percent of them are exceed those expectations so I feel like what we've done is set up a system where we can place children anywhere and they're going to have high quality learning opportunities and that's just one way to ensure that all students have access to high quality learning experiences every single day because it shouldn't matter the third grader at this school in this teacher's classroom and the third grader over here in this teacher's classroom thank you Mr. Settle. thank you mr chairman thank you dr harris for being with us tonight um i'm just a few questions and mine are easy <laughs> Good. I only want the easy ones. <laughs> Softball questions over here. When and to what group and on what subject was your last speech? Mm. It was Monday night of this week to our aspiring administrator academy. I have a group of about 20 aspiring administrators they're all teachers or psychologists i got a wonderful group this year who applied to our program and i meet with them every month for two hours and we talk about uh, educational leadership centered around the the tills the tennessee instructional leader uh, framework and we talked about exactly what i just shared the evaluation process how you support teachers uh, how you get them resources so that they can become the very best version of themselves. And I got pretty excited and passionate about this whole idea of getting on the same page to ensure that every child has a high quality learning experience every single day. Cool, thank you. Um, what is your favorite subject to present on? Like if you had to do a presentation, mm. if they called you from TSBA and said, hey, we're just going to open it up, you can talk about whatever you want to talk about. What would be your favorite subject? Ooh, only one? Only one. <laughs> I would have to say building capacity in leaders. That's, that's, that's my favorite subject area. It's what I did my dissertation on, building a principal pipeline, because nobody's ready to be a principal on day one how do we ensure that people are ready to lead to lead schools but we've got phenomenal leaders in schools everywhere that are searching for support they need 
a, a strategy. They are doing this work al many times alone or with one or two other people. It's a lonely business being a school administrator. So I love talking about the research around that and helping build that capacity and, and, and sharing all of that with anyone who will listen. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, my last question, have you been successful in getting strong parental and community support for a school program or even a district? And tell us one of such stories. Outside of COVID, uh, I, I think The best example I'll give you is, is back at Gompers Elementary School, we adopted a new uh, ELA curriculum because we had poor reading scores. And it was not great. And the teachers were very unhappy with it too. And I, I, I had phenomenal teachers. It was not a teacher problem. It was, I, I was convinced it was a resource problem and a curriculum problem. And the district gave us the opportunity to pilot a program. So I brought those teachers and said, look at all this stuff, decide what you want to do, and let's figure out a plan together. And we became a pilot and a model, and they talked with their parents because what they wanted to know was if, if we actually do the 20 minutes of reading every day at home, our parents seeing a difference. So we got parent support for this because we wanted to see if it was going to work. And by golly, if it didn't work, it was great, and we were all on the same page about it. Well, after I left, the district ended up adopting that entire series, and this was a, this is the Madison Metropolitan School District, which was very large, and, and lots of elementary schools. Uh, so that, that's just one example, but I'd like to give you a second one, if you don't mind. No, sure. When I was a middle school principal at Rossview, uh, we had the opportunity to be a pilot middle school for response to intervention and instruction on the academic side. And at the middle school level, well, middle schools are just special places. We all know that. But uh, we tackled that, uh, but our PTO was extremely supportive in wanting to give us feedback on if they felt like it was making the connection from the interventions into the work that students were actually doing at Tier 1. So I feel like that was very, uh, it was helpful not only to us, but also to the rest of the district that ended up having to move into RTI the following year at the big middle schools. Thank you so much. Mr. Ballard. Okay. Uh, this is going to be relative to problem solving and making decisions. None of that goes on, does it? <laughs> uh, th think of a problem that was brought to you recently. Just somebody developed a problem or something you were doing developed a problem that you weren't expecting at all, and what was the problem and how did you handle it? I think the biggest problem that we've had to deal with most recently in my department has been virtual teacher evaluations. So our teachers who teach full time in a virtual setting with students uh, looks very different than the traditional teacher that is face to face. So the state had sent some guidance to us which, which has been helpful. It came very late. So that's fine. But it was, principals were like, we've got to get started on these or we're going to be behind. And so I researched it. I put together some professional development and I've held four sessions on it for our school administrators so that we can do this effectively and collectively. Uh, and I want our teachers to know too that we're, we're doing it the same way so there's consistency uh, because everybody gets nervous about their evaluation and, and we want to give actionable feedback so that teachers can continuously learn and I want to make sure that the children in the virtual learning program have outstanding learning opportunities okay thank you and then recently what about the most important decision you made let's leave COVID out of this one okay the most important decision you made recently to explain how you involve the people who would be most affected by the decision So one of the things that each district gets to do each year is complete the evaluation flexibility MOU with the State Department about how you're going to conduct your teacher and leader evaluations. And 
when we did our site visits for our principal evaluations and gathered the evidence, standard A is all about building capacity and teachers uh, to teach very well. And that was not looking very good. And not because of any fault of our principals, but because we'd asked them to focus on creating a safe and healthy learning environment. So they were, they were building their plans for temperature checks and contact tracing and social distancing. They were not focused on the things that they'd been focused on. And it really didn't feel fair to me to evaluate them and give them lower scores because we'd asked them to focus on something different. It also didn't, it wasn't right to change the rubric or give people scores based on feelings because the, the rubric didn't change. So we talked about it with our leaders and decided to ask for a change with our MOU with the State Department. So I called David Donaldson, uh, the, who's over human capital with um, the commissioner and with Miss Martha Moore and we changed it and we talked with our principals about it. We're gonna actually talk with it, them about it tomorrow as well about what this process is looking forward so they understand that we're only gonna score them once at the end of the year based on all the evidence that we have because we need more evidence because they're doing good work. They just need the time to do it here in the second semester. And so in Wilson County, the administrator's observation averages directly impact their merit pay increases for the following year. So that was not going to be fair to them because they'd been focused on other things as we'd asked them to be. Okay, very good, thank you. Mr. Richardson? Yes, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Good evening, Dr. Harris. Hi. Murfreesboro is a very special community and so my questions will be about how you've been able to have um, interactions with communities here in Tennessee in developing and creating visions uh, for system-wide or school-wide um, goals. So if you could describe how you've done that here in Tennessee. When I was a middle school principal in Clarksville, Montgomery County for four years, uh, our, our school was a a level one school and we needed to focus on what our goals were so we created a vision with our leadership team and figured out how we were going to move forward because it wasn't because people weren't working hard it was eventually we weren't working on the right work and we weren't focused about it we were trying too many things all at once once we got very focused and I got better at feedback to them we achieved that, and when I left Rossview, we were a level five school, and that wasn't because of me, but that's because we did it together, and we, we knew what we wanted to achieve, and when the data came back that year, I said, wow, this actually works. When it came to Wilson County, same thing. We had people who did not know how to either create a vision, build a purposeful community around it, or they didn't know how to monitor and evaluate the, the changes that were happening uh, and how to really focus. And, and we've done that. We were an exemplary district. I'm glad that you said something about monitoring and evaluating because my next question is how you've used planning and goal setting to achieve that vision. So if you could speak more on the metrics that you used. So every school is unique and each principal has uh, a set of data and a group of students they're trying to serve. And you can't be cookie cutter about it, but you can be cookie cutter about the process, I'm convinced. So one of the things we do with our administrators every semester is a data review at the district level. They dig into their school data as a school team with principal assistant, principal instructional coach, figure out what is their area of fo focus going to be. Is it fifth grade ELA, is it third grade math? That's the PLC that I'm overseeing. And what is the metric that you're gonna know that your actions are leading to outcome, better outcomes for students? So whether that's common formative assessments or the summative data, uh, whatever the metric is, student absenteeism, whatever you've got to work on, you set a goal, you set a review date, and then what are your actions? And Part of my work has been helping them figure out what those metrics should be, but also what the action should be by the administrator with the teacher teams. Change is difficult. I think that's been a theme. How have you obtained support in implementing these new visions and including those metrics uh, that can be difficult at times? 
So we implemented uh, McCurl's Balanced Leadership Framework. It's not a program, it's a framework. And there's uh, the, the research started with Mar Marzano way back in the day. And the work from that has been what are the, what are the leadership responsibilities that it requires uh, of school leaders to make outcomes change for kids? Because we know second to the teacher, we know the teacher is the most important with managing um, those indicators with kids. It's the school principal and the assistant principal and the leaders are in that school. Can you repeat your question one more time? Yes, because they're all tied together. That yep. was tough. How did you garner support? When we implemented balanced leadership the first year, uh, we actually had Dr. B.J. Worthington from Clarksville Montgomery come and train our, our principals. We had six of us become internal trainers so that we could train our assistant principals and then every year after that, we brought on board any new administrators, uh, people that had come and joined the district. And all of our work is around these principals and, and I, principals, not the leaders, but these ideas and our conversations come back to it all of the time. We got through COVID using our framework and best practices of leaders. And once people saw what to do and how to do it, and then they saw that it impacted their kids, you're sold. When you have success, you just get more success after that because you, you want it to be replicable. And that's the key in education. How do we find what works and do it more and bigger and better and across broader spaces? If you don't have your metrics down, you won't know if you're making a difference. So it'd be fair to say that by example, you were able to get support through your success. Absolutely, and through other people's successes. They, they, they hit it on the head when they, when they met their metrics and became reward schools or closed gaps for children. It's, it's really exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Christina, my, my area will be on regarding teacher and as a teacher and administrator, how you understand the day-to-day -day operations of schools. Now, one question that I'll ask you is, uh, with schools in our system, you know, we have those that are the high range of free and reduced. We have those that are the low range of free and reduced. How do you, would you plan to institute a program that will be within a reasonable expectation as well as meeting the needs of both upper and lower? You have to ensure that you have a guaranteed and viable curriculum. And what that means is what I said earlier, that students have access to grade level standards, every child, and opportunities to learn at high levels. And if you set up a system where those things happen, you ensure that students have access and opportunity to learn. Second to that, what happens when they don't learn or what happens when they already know it? You've got to have a systematic way that you're supporting students who are struggling or are behind through interventions that are based on research. And then you have to align your supports and your resources. So whoever has more needs gets more resources. It's, we, we don't all need the same thing. We need different things. And different schools need different things at different times. If you're not paying attention, you can't build in those supports. I'm not a big program fan. I'm a system fan. You build up good systems and you have good strategy, you can bring in any program and see if it's done with fidelity, if it works. Uh, and programs come and programs go, but systems are something that can be maintained for a very long time and continue to increase outcomes for students. All right, in, in relation to that, and, and you're talking about the instruction and all, okay, uh, there is a need, I think we all would agree, that uh, a one-to-one -one ratio of technology and computers in the classroom. What would be your goals for the district trying to regard in regarding technology and maintaining some of those avenues to betterments? Well, one-to-one -one technology is something I wish every student had 
across the United States, and we're just not there yet. And we realize that very quickly, what a huge need that is. You've got to you got to be strategic about it. you got to put your, your money where you want your resources to be and what students need. But it isn't just about the device. It's about how you use the device. And you could put a device in every child's hand, but if teachers don't know how to use it and feel comfortable with the programs that you've purchased, it won't really matter. So I feel very strongly about whatever you buy that's going to be in front of kids there has to be professional development and learning and ongoing professional development and learning. And if that can't happen, don't buy the thing because otherwise it's, it's going to be a waste of a resource. Okay. And you have touched on this a little bit already, uh, but describe your experience in developing or implementing and evaluating an instructional program. Pick a pick. Let's let's say a reading program. You were talking okay. about reading a few minutes ago. So I I feel like I'm being repetitive. You've got to know what you're trying to do. So if we're trying to increase our outcomes for kids in reading in literacy, we want more kids to read at grade level and demonstrate that on a daily basis. What is the goal for next week? What is the goal on our next summative assessment? What does the planning look like in that process? You have to start with the teachers and how they're planning their lessons. It, it does no good to come to the table after the fact and say, oh, you guys didn't meet the goal. Jeez, we're really upset with you. It's in the meeting where we're talking about those standards and making sure teachers are, understand what the standards mean and have what they need in order to teach it at the level they need to teach it at. And then in the classroom, you gotta be in there. You gotta be where the game is played. A coach, you know, on any team is right there when the game is happening. I feel very strongly that school leaders have to be in classrooms and engage with the learning process to know it's actually happening uh, for students. What learning experiences uh, do you, have you found to be the most useful in improving, improving student achievement? I'm a believer in explicit direct instruction. I believe that uh, teachers can become masters at their craft if they know what strategies to use and when to use them. Uh, there's so much out there on what best practice actually is, but there are very few research-based instructional strategies. So let's narrow it down to these right here, when to use them and how to use them. Let's get really good at them. Let's get really good at them all together uh, and help teachers learn what those are. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, yes, you did. Okay. All right, Mr. Ballard. Okay, thank you. Um, we touched on Mr. Campbell's question regarding technology, but to be a little more specific, what educational technologies have you introduced to your schools? Why and how did you do it? So in my current role, uh, I work, I work mostly, mostly with teachers and leaders. So, I, and I want to use a, a current example uh, because technology has taken over in this time. If you think back to what happened in May uh, when we were on lockdown in your first Zoom meeting, if you had it, and we had a whole summer of professional development coming up that was supposed to be engaging and in person. And we knew if we didn't have some training on what these resources were, we were gonna lose a whole summer of PD. So I sat there for two weeks and joined webinars and figured out what a Zoom was and what a breakout room was and how to share my screen and all of that. But additionally, wanting to model for our leaders and our teachers how they were gonna be able to do this with their children in Google Meets and such. That was a big undertaking, but I'm so glad that I did. Uh, Dr. Wright has always said, don't delegate if you don't know how to do something already. And so I'm a big believer that you got to get in there and play with it yourself and be able to model it. Additionally, when we adopted our learning management system, uh, uh, Thrivist, I use that as a, a tool to model for anyone I worked with, for any professional development, how to use it. I put all my stuff in there, and that's what we used for our reentry planning, just to say, if this is what we're all going to use, I'm going to use it too. Okay, uh, thank you for that. And we're all working toward reopening schools. 
So as director, how would you address the safe operations and teaching and learning and student wellness to, uh, and attention to equity throughout to try to get us back into traditional open schools? Well, we know a lot more now than we did when this whole thing started. And the community now understands, when you think back, there was a lot of panic from parents about bringing children back, and then a lot of panic from teachers and administrators about them getting sick. And so now we've learned what it means to social distance. That, that was a term that you know wasn't around when we first started this. So it's, it's, ongoing, it's an ongoing system that you have to reevaluate and knowing what your goals are, whatever the goals are for Murfreesboro City Schools to have children at school or learning virtually or however, however the group has decided this is how we want to have school, it would be my job to ensure that that happens in a safe and healthy way. So one of the things that I would do that I, I, we did in Wilson County, what I would make sure we are in all of those schools checking on the things that we expect. You can't expect anything if you're not inspecting it and giving feedback on how things can be you know, better. So if, if there is a mask mandate, then we should be walking halls and seeing that. If children should be social distance in classrooms, then we need to be checking on that. And if people need support for how to do it, we need to be willing to problem solve with them to make sure it's what we want it to be. So it has to be collaborative and there has to be feedback built into it. Okay. Thank you, that's all for me right now. Okay. All right, board members, any of you have any other questions? Um, yeah. Okay, oh, Ms. Goff? I don't think that we covered uh, your thoughts on the whole child approach. Did we, did, I, did any of that come out? Mm. Uh, that's been something that we okay. really embrace in our district and Absolutely. I was just curious to see. When I looked at the data for the district and also your master plan, which I think is well crafted and I don't disagree with anything that's on there. It, there is a huge emphasis on the whole child, which I completely agree with. We know that children have mental health needs and it's growing, especially with COVID and, and families have a lot of needs. Uh, we know that children still need to eat every day and we know that behaviors will be on the rise when, whenever we put children back in classrooms, that's, that's tough. So I feel strongly about several things one of which is making sure that we have trained our teachers and administrators in a comprehensive program on how to organize classrooms that are safe and are inclusive of every child. So I'm a, I'm a comp trainer. I think MTS uses that, MTSU uses that in their teacher prep program. And I'm a strong believer in, in systems, and I've said that before, but you have to have confidence as a teacher to deal with difficult children and children don't show up and say, I'm, uh, I'm having a horrible day, you're gonna have to help me differently. They just spaz out. They have a moment and teachers are supposed to be teaching at high levels. What do we do then? Well, it has to be professional learning and ongoing support. And then you have to have tiers. I, I am so glad that RTI2B is, has been implemented here uh, because it's a system, it's a structure that helps everybody understand what we're trying to achieve. That hollering at kids is not acceptable and is not going to reduce behaviors, it's only going to make them worse. But teachers have to have a solid understanding of themselves in order to help with difficult behaviors. You have to manage yourself first. You have to know it's actually not my problem, the child's having the problem, I'm the adult in the room, how am I gonna handle this? Uh, and, and it's practice. We all get better with practice, administrators as well. Uh, but social workers are key, our psychologists are key, and they bring a whole skill set that many of us didn't have in our teacher prep or administrator preparation programs that you have to partner with. They have wonderful knowledge and skills that should be shared at a greater level. So I believe in whole child supports. It's part of the What Matters Most framework that I teach in Balanced Leadership. And that's a huge lever to increase outcomes for all kids. You have to have safe and inclusive environments for children to be able to learn, and you have to start there. Okay, thank you. Ms. Moore. Thank you. Um, I'm glad that you acknowledge that it is, uh, change is scary, and acknowledge that you are an external candidate when there are internal candidates in the pool. So my question is about, um, 
The balance between being someone new to a district and coming in with ideas of how things can work and can be better and room for improvement versus how long you spend getting to know the district in a different way, recognizing the role of coming from outside. And I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit about how you would approach you know, your first few months on the job. I think the timing is, is very helpful for when this position would begin in April. Uh, if that's what it still is, I'm assuming that it still is. It's a wonderful time to build relationships because you're not gonna come in and change anything in April. That's a horrible time to change anything. That's a wonderful time to get to know what's happening and the people that are making the work happen. So I would spend that time in schools because you've got teachers and all of the other support staffs present and you can see those operations in action and gather the information. I'm a visual person. I want to see what's happening when it's happening. I don't want to read about it on a piece of paper. I want to go see and interact and ask questions and gather information and hear from people. So that's what I would do to start with the end of the year closing out. I would just go learn and listen and, and build relationships with people. Uh, m talk with the leadership people, uh, whatever team that is or it needs to be can change. It can be multiple. I don't know. Uh, but then figuring out what are we going to do to move forward? What are the needs? Where do the resources need to be? And then what are our next steps? So then you start to make a plan for how to engage in that work. And I think you do have to balance. I will have to balance because I'm achiever and activator, which means I'll go, I'll go too fast. So I do need people to say that's probably too much. We probably can't take that on. And I'm, I want them to say that, but I, I don't want to wait and allow students to fall through the gaps in the process. If there's something that can happen where we can increase outcomes more quickly for children, I want to ensure that that happens. But longer term, what is our, what is our three, four, five year goal that we want to see? Uh, not just for the first year, but what do you all want to see in this district? And then I can map that out and then you just plan your work and work your plan. Okay. Ms. Barton? Yeah, I, I have a question. It's going to seem very basic, but if you've said it, I haven't heard it, so that's why I'm asking. All right. I'd like to know why you started teaching, mm -hmm. and then I'd like to know what made you decide to become a, an administrator or central office staff. So I didn't want to be a teacher when I was in high school, I wanted to be a doctor because the other people in my family had been teachers and I thought I could do better. And then I spent a semester on a block schedule in Mrs. Barnes' fourth grade class in Future Teachers of America. Well, there's nothing better than teaching. You can't do any better than being a teacher. <laughs> and so I, I really owe a lot to Ms. Barnes in that experience because watching children learn how to read, I, that's why I got my reading specialist endorsement because of what I saw. I was like, I want to do that. It was so fulfilling to be there for that uh, semester of time in that fourth grade teacher's classroom. And so I jumped into it and I was teaching my little heart out and loving every second of teaching fifth grade and, and I had one okay year in sixth grade. <laughs> I would have been a teacher on a support plan that sixth grade year, I'll just tell you. <laughs> uh, but my principal came to me and said, you know, Christina, we have this administrative intern program and I think you'd be a wonderful applicant. I thought, I would? And so I said, sure. So I got into my master's program and became an administrative intern assistant principal for two years. I was like, this is great. So I love being a leader and working with teachers. And then I realized you can be a principal of a whole school. How phenomenal would that be? So then I got to be a principal. And then I went to be a middle school principal. And the, the reason I came to Wilson County was because I was making this, this drive from, from Wilson to Clarksville Montgomery County, which is a little bit of a drive. And I, I was missing things of our boys, which was not good. And so I said, I just need to be closer to home. And Wilson County gave me the opportunity to come into HR and work with new teachers and new administrators. And I thought, this is amazing too. <laughs> so I could go back to any one of those jobs and be perfectly happy because education as a whole is just a phenomenal uh, industry. And what we do every single day is is just the best 
Thank you. Mr. Richardson? Yes, Mr. Chair, and thank you. With an increase in access to technology, and specifically social media, there has been an exponential growth in cyberbullying. And we know that cyberbullying has an impact on the mental health and well-being of children, as well as their academic achievement. As director, how would you approach that issue and protect our children? I think we probably need to start with parents because adults aren't super good at it either, if you've noticed. So it's, ooh, social media is a dangerous place right now for all kinds of reasons. And I think we have to help the community understand whatever behaviors we're modeling, our children are picking up on and they're, they're having problems because of it. I know a lot of adults that are having problems because of what's happening on social media for all kinds of reasons. So education's a wonderful place to model great behavior. So I would, I think you gotta get out there and, and help people understand the real world actually doesn't happen on social media. It happens with relationships with one another. And how do we model good practices and behaviors? And how can we get expected of kids if it's not happening at home? So help us out here, people. Let's work together. Because we don't want our children to suffer cyberbullying, mental health challenges, whatever, because of what could have been prevented by, by better practice. Very well. Thank you so very much. Thank you. You're in Wilson County now. Explain to us, please, what your plan, what plan you are in under right now in regards to schools and students and when they go or when they don't go? Sure. Currently, our students are fully remote, and so they're learning from home, and they, they, we ended the semester in a remote plan, and they came back for two weeks uh, in a remote plan. Uh, we evaluate every Wednesday and share out with our community on Thursday what the structure will be for the following week so that it gives uh, parents and teachers uh, the long weekend to figure out what they need to do for childcare and, and school. And we try to stay in a model for two weeks at a time uh, because our, our metrics don't typically change every week. They change in kind of two week cycles, but it also helps with planning. How do you handle parents in those these situations? Oh, with compassion. This is a hard time. It, I agree. It's, mm -hmm. it's just not awesome. And I think it's not what we really want. Uh, you're balancing what parents need to work, but you're also balancing all of the people that run the school and the adults that work there. And you can't have school if you don't have grown-ups to supervise children. And it's that constant balance of wanting to do what's best for kids and getting them in the building to make sure that they learn, uh, but providing a safe and healthy space for, for teachers and support staff. Our bus drivers, our cafeteria workers, all of them are important to making school run. And without adults, you don't have school. Okay, thank you. Our board will meet on Tuesday of next week. Okay. Which will be the 19th. And the last thing on our agenda will be to try to select the candidate uh, of our choice that we want to pre rep recommend or we want to hire or to give a contract to, I guess I say. Uh, that contract we can offer uh, February the 9th. And then, uh, accepting of that contract, then the new director will assume duties on April the 5th. Now, is there anything there you go. else? We were all saying, she didn't, he didn't give her the chance to say anything else. I'm sorry. <laughs> is there anything else? I'll get to it if you just be patient. <laughs> I'm old. Sometimes, Butch, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to tell us before we adjourn for the night? Anything at all? I do appreciate just the opportunity to interview. I realize that um, this doesn't happen every day. This is my first interview like this. <laughs> Scared to death earlier today. <laughs> you guys have been wonderful. Uh, 
I realize it's a really big job and I take that very seriously. The, the night that I applied on the TSBA website, it took me about 30 minutes to push the submit button, I'll be honest with you, because the, the weight of this job is gigantic. I don't even, I don't know what it is because I've never done it, but I've watched some people do it really well and I think, whew, that's, that's an important role. But I do think I could make a, a really big difference in the lives of the children in this community uh, that wouldn't just be for a reading test, but longer term. And I love teachers. Teachers need support. This is very difficult work and leaders need support uh, and the community needs to trust in the public education system because public education cannot go out of style. It educates the most children in the 50 states. So I want to continue to be a part of public education and I said before I applied because of the criteria you put out, I felt like it had my name on it and I just appreciate being selected to get to talk to you tonight and the time you're investing in this. I'm so glad you're doing this five nights in a row. I know you'll be exhausted come Friday, but it's a really important thing that you're doing and I appreciate just getting the opportunity to share. So thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate you having an interest in becoming a member of Mercer City Schools mm -hmm. staff. Uh, I will tell you this after our decision is made, Someone will call you and let you know, thank you, you're the one we select, or I'm sorry we have selected somebody else. I was always a firm believer in that, interviewing teachers, yeah. because they're anxiously awaiting. Mm -hmm. But we'll let so you true. know something. But again, thank you very much for being here. We've enjoyed having you for the day and drive safely going back to Westmoreland. Thank you Ooh. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and we are adjourned. <laughs>